everyone. Welcome back to the virtual stage at around 2021. And for this talk, I would like to welcome Noah Sossman, a creative professional from California, living and working in Germany, learning to survive on snow instead of sunshine. To date, most of his work has been in the sports industry. He embraces creative evolution in whatever form he finds. He sees it as a means to elevate brands and businesses. Welcome, Noah. Hi, Daniela. How are you? Good, and you? Good. I'm, I'm tired. I, I knew I was going to talk, but I didn't realize I was going to listen to everything <laughs> and comment on everything and also try to work at the same time. So this has been absolutely awesome up till now. I think, uh, I think it was Maurizio kind of exploded my head with his, uh, with his talk yesterday. So yeah. I think he did with everyone. <laughs> all right. Well, Noah, I think you're also going to show us something really interesting. So I'll leave it to you to you do your thing and see you later for the uh, for the questions. Great. Thanks, Daniela. So welcome, everybody. Thank you guys for being here. Um, I'm going to talk for about 20 to 25 minutes. And I'm focusing in my talk on the tools and the workflow that I've used and that I use over the years to do my job. I'm gonna share some things which have been really helpful to me as I navigate very often being the only creative professional in the room at work. So as a creative in Germany, for example, I'm often fighting for my seat at the table as management and others struggle to understand what value design brings to their business. So first I'll interview, uh, sorry, I'll introduce myself as a creative professional, a few words about why I do creative work instead of being a doctor or a lawyer, then I'll share what I've observed in myself and others as I discovered Gravity Sketch and what I jokingly label the four phases. It's meant to be a bit funny, but actually I wrote a short presentation for a sports company about how to smooth the design team's move towards digital tools. And there's some really interesting psychology around the idea of adopting new tools. So. Then I'll get to the core of my talk and discuss how I'm using tools now in my day-to-day -day work for a tech-based startup and share some samples of work and workflow which reflect my current status with these tools. Of course, the samples I show are not going to be from my employer. That work is all top secret, but the projects mostly have been done um, using similar workflow, similar tools. So you'll see that these are the things I'm doing now to do the creative work that I absolutely love doing. And finally, after sharing my work, I'll touch briefly on the future of my workflow with these tools as I see it. And then I'll turn the microphone back over to Daniela for comments and questions. So let's go ahead and get this screen up and running. I've had some problems during the day. I want to make sure that you guys can actually see that. I yeah, honestly, yeah. okay, good. Because it's, yeah. it's happened a couple times today that I had a little thumbnail of all these beautiful images. <laughs> and uh, yeah, okay, so we got it. We got it going. Cool. So let's jump right in to my creative background. Because you need to have some background information. I grew up with an orthopedic surgeon uh, and a master craftsman as parents. That meant x-rays for spine, hip, hand, knee repair and replacement uh, in the home. Also working drawings for custom furniture, stained glass windows. Essentially to me now, I see that those are, those are imagery elements for planning complex projects. And this eclectic mix meant that there was not really a logical to the tools that I wanted to use to create visual communication. I simply took and mixed all of this stuff in my desire to communicate ideals visually from pencils and pens to Wacoms, CAD software, airbrushes, and everything in between. I've always been open to trying whatever creative tools I've come across. In this progression, however, of picking up new tools, Gravity Sketch has been something special. If you take a bit of that magic of learning how to use an airbrush or a tablet, digital stylus, CAD software, you roll all that into one, pump it full of steroids. That's what finding and learning the software has been like. It's, a, it's been an intense experience and I've documented 
and I've documented kind of the roller coaster of this uh, as having four distinct phases that I observed in myself and I've also seen in others. It really is something new. The software is, it's nuts. So finding it, experiencing it, learning it, it's a roller coaster. <clears throat> and here are the four phases that I've seen in myself. There's this curiosity at first about creative tools in VR. And uh, there's this excitement in this curiosity based on having drudged through CAD work for years. And then phase two, upon trying it, just kind of one touch point, having a touch point with it, there's this explosion of enthusiasm and evangelizing about VR and this tool in particular and sort of an out of control excitement. And then uh, I moved into sort of a creative rapture and sort of experimentation output phase, doing that first project in VR, which I think most people who've done this have done. And it gets pushed out into the world in a sort of breathless transformational way of working. And then finally, this acceptance phase. Look, the magic is real, it's amazing, but it works. And I'm settling in and using the tools on a daily and weekly basis. In my case, in tandem with Rhino and every once in a while with some heavier uh, rendering packages like C-Shot. I do have a history with VR. Um, 1994, <laughs> a video gaming arcade in San Francisco popped up. I was an industrial design student at the time. I was studying product design in San Francisco. Um, I've also studied uh, transportation design. So I, I have a degree in both, one from the Art Center in Los Angeles and one from California College of Arts in San Francisco. But I was a student at the time, it was 94, a VR student, uh, sorry, a VR video arcade opened up in San Francisco. We had professors from Hewlett Packard, Apple, IDEO, and everybody no, was really- Sorry to interrupt, like your audio is breaking up. I'm not sure what might be happening. That could be the that could be where I live. <laughs> that could be everybody in in Nuremberg on uh, on the internet. Okay, that's much better. Let's see. If, okay. if... Um, at least I'll make sure to keep the microphone in the right spot. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just give me a shout again if it happens. So uh, we had professors from Apple, IDEO, Hewlett Packard, mid '90s. So they were pumped up on the internet. They were pumped up on this new mobile computing. But as a young guy, I was really more interested in video gaming, in VR, like immersive video gaming. And so I had started to learn CAD for industrial design, but it was really mostly being used by architects at the time. And there wasn't a real strong connection for me in my mind between VR tools and design. It was just a way to play video games. I bought tickets for the VR arcade online. I went down and literally put on one of these horrible headsets that you see in this video was blown away by the immersion. And then after three minutes, I was sick, like a dog. Um, and I parted ways with VR, sweaty, dizzy, and just very, very unhappy. That was 94. So jump ahead to 2018 or so, maybe 2017. And that I was in the middle of some standard, just industrial design hustle here in Germany. I was working with a client developing a high chair for kids. And the project was at a phase where I would have started traditionally on 3D. I would have start jumped into CAD. I think it was Alias at the time. And I just had never really learned to love the process of CAD. It felt like a grind. But at this time I saw an article online about Google's product, Tilt Brush. And they specifically mentioned in the article that the problem of latency had been solved. And so, with my experimental and open attitude towards new tools and technology and trying to put the 94, like that vomit inducing VR arcade experience behind me, I decided to try it out. So I went into a local electronics store that I found here in Nuremberg where they were demoing Vive, uh, the HTC Vive headsets. <clears throat> Excuse me. But after just a few minutes, um, I was in a headset and then in tilt brush within just a few minutes. And that's really when the magic happened. <coughs> so sorry. Standing in the middle of the sales room floor, I was able to gesturally 
create the design direction that I had been pen sketching in just a matter of seconds at scale in front of me with zero latency or motion sickness. And I was just blown away. Not only had VR been fixed, you could design in it. And these images right here are so raw because just on a side note, I was so excited that I held my camera up to the, to the eyepiece of the headset and snapped these, <clears throat> excuse me, snapped these photos through the lens. I'm gonna have to drink something. I'm having an allergy attack here. <clears throat> but the, the, I was just instantly blown away there, there was a lack of precision with the tools. And so I went in every day for weeks, messing around with tilt brush, just learning to play with it. But it really was kind of a play tool for me. And then I discovered James Robbins on YouTube. And I think I watched his first or maybe his second video. And I saw that he was working with people I had studied with. And this was a very serious tool. And he was really using it for work. I turned around, went back to the store and dropped a bunch of money on a brand new PC, a brand new headset, and I was off and running and then entered the second phase, this evangelizing, and I kind of lost my mind. I was talking to everybody, uh, recording uh, screen cap uh, videos. Um, I bothered James Robbins. I bothered Glenn Southern. I even sent some crazy emails to Shay. It was just shocking for me to be one of the few people in my network who had discovered the software and saw the, the potential benefit. I'm pretty sure I tortured most of my friends and most of the people in my network, talking, writing, talking, writing, Adidas, Volvo, Nike people, all, all these, just all these contacts of mine, a former clay modeler. But it became clear to me that I wasn't really doing what I love, which is creating stuff and designing stuff. So this brings me to phase three, which is this creative, rapture where I settled in at home with my new computer and could really stretch the legs on this this monster shiny PC running gravity sketch and I decided I wanted to kind of pit this evangelical enthusiasm against one of the most challenging things I've ever had to do as a designer which is automotive projects creating this umbrella concept a story sketching fleshing it out in 3D, and then ultimately a quarter scale clay model. It's just an intense and drawn out process, which had strained me to my limit as a student. So I quickly scribbled some ideas down, what you see here, and I brought them into my new virtual studio. And within a few hours, I had the bones, the full size tape lines, not on a massive sheet of vellum taped on a wall, but in space, in 3D, it was shocking. I spent plenty of time just sitting on my sofa at this point, staring at this 3D tape drawing, which would have cost me so many hours just a week before. And by the way, there's a feature request here, which is a turntable that I can have smoothly spin my, my uh, drawing or my sketch in gravity uh, at variable speed. It's such a critical, it's such a critical thing. I would love to have that. Anyway, I quickly took those, those first uh, tape lines, I pulled surfaces over these, and in less than two days, I had a full-size first draft concept model of my sketches in my living room, which I could walk around at full scale, boom. Um, and I just applied this, this, uh, this kind of rapture, this creative just rapture with this to a couple of products that I had already worked on. I pulled some backpack sketches from my time at Adidas, two ballpoint pen sketches, jumped into the studio, straps, pockets, silhouette on the body, placement of all the zippers, cut so lines. It was just fast and fun. And also at this time, I connected with somebody named Marcus Bauer, who's a very talented 3D uh, designer and artist. And he said, yeah, you can render this stuff. You can put it into Keyshot, which I'd never used up to that point. And he did these for me really quickly. And um, yeah, it just kind of fed the, the fire. Another project in this phase, I grabbed some sketches from a bike helmet that I had designed while working at UVEX Sport. And again, boom, within a few hours, I had a 3D model in CAD. And I don't know if anyone here ever tried Project Falcon, which is a standalone wind tunnel, a digital wind tunnel. But if you combine something like that with these new tools, you're talking about saving a bike helmet company tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars a year 
on design development and primarily testing costs. So you can <laughs> you can put that in your pipe and smoke it. Any business nerds that are listening. So that was the creative rapture phase of discovering Gravity Sketch, pretty much done. And that leads me to the next phase, which I call the acceptance phase, where I'm starting to integrate the magic into my into my daily business. <clears throat> and you can see here, I'm settling in and with more confidence and a bit more trust, I can just throw down a few pen sketches, a few good reference images and a story, and I'm, I'm just ready to start 3D. Um, I know I'll, not, I'll have that 3D to help share the story of my, my design, but I'll also have a space to share it in with the, with the headset and with the software. Uh, in this slide, actually, I've started to design a bicycle saddle, but given the speed and the fun of the software, why not? building those concepts on a full-size bike. So, <clears throat> so that's, that's what I did. I, I built the bike first and then was able to work on ideas for saddles uh, in that environment. <coughs> Excuse me. So here you can see the really nice, um, I think this is Rhino uh, 7 pre-visualization. And this is kind of my go-to tool for creating screenshots. I've tried, like I said, I've tried more intense rendering tools, but I just don't have the patience to, to, you know, to be like an expert on the physics of light or vocabulary of light to get a good image. I really do appreciate good renderings, but in my opinion, these tools need to get a lot more intuitive and affordable before I'm on board. The, just the speed with which I can get stuff into 3D now means I don't want to spend three times as long just to create a rendering. Here's another one, sort of in this acceptance phase where I'm actually uh, developing some design for, in this case, it's a former SEAL. This guy uh, had some, he approached me to help me develop some eyewear for just a very special use case. And I can turn ideas around for him in 3D with just unprecedented speed, as well as explain some of the complexity of the features of the product. And then we come here, and this was actually an experiment. It's not the prettiest of the slides, but this is actually kind of an important turning point. This was an experiment to do collaborative presentation work sessions with uh, Jaron Dorman. And I believe we had someone else with us. I can't remember who that was. But the idea here was to do not just my design work, but to present and then discuss and even maybe workshop the project in Gravity Sketch, and it was the first time I had really done this. And guess what? It worked really, really well. We reviewed it, dissected it, and sketched on this design kind of at a level of productivity that I'd really never experienced other than, let's say, being in a factory in China with a cross-functional development team and a manufacturer. And in this case, I was you know, sitting in a tiny little attic space somewhere in southern Germany, and the other two guys that were there, God only knows where they were. And so we've really hit something interesting, just the, the idea of sharing the fruits then of this kind of mind-blowing new tool. I, yeah, I got to do the, the collaboration type work here on this Ortlieb bag, but it was with other VR nerds. So how do you release this experience into the wild, into a world of non-designer, non-VR people? And so that's what this is. This is one of my first professional presentations to non-designers and uh, non-VR people, non-VR nerds. And I say that with respect and affection. But in this case, we had four CEOs in the company, busy people, a lot of stuff on their mind. And so how do I present? How do I bring them into this world? So in this case, I had a tethered headset at work. And what I did was I mapped it to a long empty space in my office in Munich. And when one of these people would come down, one of these CEOs would come down to review design instead of looking at printouts, which traditionally that's how I would do it. It was quick or on a screen. I, I just hand them the headset and it was a virtual showroom and they could walk up and down reviewing uh, these options. And I would sit at my monitor and literally watch through their eyes as they gave feedback and shared very candid reactions to these different designs. It was just a transformed way of getting feedback. They were alone with the work and they were reacting to it as if they were alone. 
And so I could note down what delighted them, what caught their attention, where they looked, where they lingered. This is basically same thing, different day, but because that presentation had worked so well, here I'm actually using gravity to present 3D of some of my designs in the same way to the same group. But in this case, some of the models were really just Rhino models, but I found it much better to present the designs in VR, not asking anyone to put a headset on, but they could just hold it up to their eyes and move around the space. This kind of relates back to what Hennenberger said yesterday about presenting his production, like film production artwork. There's something about standing next to a really large image and uh, it's very special. Management, in my case, they really enjoyed being in a nice clean space, seeing things in an impressive scale. And I'm certain it helped sell my visions and my work for these products. So this is the, the last set of slides in this, uh, in this kind of area there. It's a bit more raw, but it shows actual kind of my workflow. And I'm working from a very informal brief from the CEO of this eyewear company. And I'm putting together in the first phase, I'm putting together sketches, pen sketches. You can see a bit of a hint, a really rough pen sketch, but then a pretty tight sketch above that. And I still lean heavily on drawing. And it's how I just kind of get my design intent and the arc for the storytelling that I'm going to do, how I sort of get it down, like see it and then tune it and then see it and tune it. It's a really nice, quick feedback loop for me. But then I very quickly will jump into Gravity Sketch now <laughs> because I can so quickly move into, to, into 3D. And again, here I did experiment with some key shot, but once again, reinforced this idea that the speed and the ease of the simple pre-visualization rendering tools in Rhino 7, they just fit the rhythm and the pace set by the speed of sketching and gravity sketching. And so again, here, here was the same question for this client was how do I share this, this speed? and the, the quantity of stuff that I, can, that I can do with these tools, how do I share that with non-VR people? And at that time, along came Quest from Facebook. And so you love them or you hate them, but having an untethered headset that I can pull out of my shoulder bag in an interview, yeah, I, I, I took it immediately. And um, I went and spoke to these guys with about 25, 26 models of eyewear, they were arranged in a row, mapped to the long access of their conference room where I was presenting this project. It was the managing director of the company and the CEO, both who had never even been in a headset. And they just held it up to their eyes in this safely mapped space. And they took their turns walking up and down, just happily experiencing uh, the designs that I had delivered. And it was hands down the best presentation I'd had up to that point in my career. They were happy. And also another really positive and solid side effect of having 3D so early in your creative process as a designer, it means that I can, as a follow-up, I can deliver some pretty nice, let's say, video content or rendering content instead of just a friendly thank you email with a screenshot or two. A sketch. Um, and if you like any of the eyewear images here, I can, I can highly recommend going checking out my uh, Behance page where there's actually a video with a turntable of the full, I think it was 25 or 26 pieces of eyewear rotating there's, with nice music underneath. There's something very soothing about watching models rotate. I don't know why. Yeah. And so then with the Quest headset in hand. I went to Berlin for a job interview and I had all the traditional gear with me, my iPad, printed resumes, printed book. And uh, the interview was with a small startup company. And I knew there were going to be a lot of people, everyone from interns to the CEO. And I've been in meetings like this before as the only designer in the room. And I know what it must feel like to be a, to be a springbok being eaten alive by lions on the savannah, just surrounded by kind of scary uh, 
predatory uh, creatures. And I, I knew I needed to make an impact. I needed to kind of grab their attention. So before the meeting, I mapped the presentation space that I had built and loaded onto my headset, and onto my new Quest. I mapped it on the small space in the conference room so it could be nicely viewed, nicely experienced by the door. And so everyone who came in through the door was handed the headset for just a moment. And they were treated to my test project, boards of sketches and a few concept design models of how I saw their innovative technology being used in the future. And so when everyone did finally settle around the table, we didn't look at my printed book. We didn't look at my iPad or slides for almost 30 or 40 minutes. We just talked about the company, the, the role they were looking to hire for and their needs and their visions. Uh, we did eventually look at slides from my portfolio, my older work at the end. It was as if someone had snapped out of this magical VR spell and remembered, okay, yeah, we're interviewing a designer. We have to look at their portfolio. So it was just really good stuff. They hired me and now I'm using Gravity Sketch uh, in my daily work at uh, Better Guards in Berlin. We have, it's like a fast paced startup environment. I work with biomechanical experts, mechanical engineers, fluid dynamics experts, uh, and sports marketing professionals. We're building our patented technology into organic, complex, human anatomy focused products. You can think of like BOA, the BOA closure system, but on steroids. So the patented Better Guards technology, it allows for free motion of joints ankles, wrists, back, under normal movement, you have free motion, but the better guard system can then lock out and protect you when acceleration and movement become dangerous or extreme. In my work at better guards, I'm integrating data sets from SolidWorks, from weird footwear pattern making software. I'm using Rhino to control and clean up these data sets or import into Gravity Sketch through Lending Pad. I'm sketching and scanning into Gravity Sketch. I'm modeling. I pre-visualize renderings and screenshots back in Rhino 7. And tying this all together, this, this, this diverse team and all these, uh, these complicated projects, I'm certain that the new collaboration features will provide a better space than Zoom or Teams or whatever to design and share and review these complex spatial and technical projects with my colleagues. It's such a diverse group. And we heard about that, that just in the previous talk, the, the, the democratization of these feedback sessions of these project development cycles. It's not linear. It's kind of the circular thing that rolls forward. Sometimes you're leading it, sometimes you're supporting it, sometimes you're following it. But when you're doing it at the same time in the same space, there's a very powerful effect that 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 has. So that's me in the fourth phase of discovering this new tool. I really truly have accepted Gravity Sketch into my toolbox. I've got three headsets at home just to work with these tools. I definitely am gonna need uh, an augmented headset for when this software goes into an augmented format, hopefully soon. Um, I'd love to have like a VR stylus as well. So I, can, I know I would enjoy doing like Photoshop style rendering and sketching in VR, just on a massive scale. I think that would be fantastic. So there you have it. I've introduced myself, shared my work, talked about the journey of discovering Gravity Sketch, um, the four phases that I saw, curiosity, evangelizing, creative rapture, and acceptance. I don't know, maybe you guys have had similar experiences. I would love to hear about it. So definitely look me up on the internet. We can talk about it if you like. And uh, yeah, thank you for your attention. I'm gonna stop screen sharing here. Thanks, Noah. That turn was great. Microphone back over to Daniela. We have a lot of great comments here. A lot of people fanning out. People asking about your contact details. Like, what's your? Um, are you on Instagram, Twitter? No. I should be. I will be. I also I also watch Gary V, so I know I should post what 10, 10 hours of content a day. I, I am in love with creative work. So 
No, I should be. I'm on, I have a portfolio on Behance and it's easy enough to like post a comment there. I think my YouTube channel probably, but I'm really easy to find. You can just my name. There's a, there's a DJ in New York with the same name. That's not me. Cool. All right. So let's jump into questions. Was your concept in your presentations for the CEO a finished render in the VR headset? I didn't know that a finished render could be in Gravity Sketch. Oh, so here's the thing about, I learned this because I've been doing this for a while and uh, I was a product designer. I, was, I studied industrial design in San Francisco in the 90s. And that's great. It's good to be a smart person and a smart designer and a thinker. And then I went back to school for car design in LA and nobody cared what I had to say or what I thought. They wanted to, they wanted to see what I could put on the wall. So everything I share has been polished in one way or another. Everything that I present, because that's my job, I'm the one person in the room who is responsible for visual communication. And it's a little hard for me to look at like a screen captured video of a gravity sketch session because it looks cartoony. When I'm in there, my brain is lit up as if I'm standing in front of a car. Like I know I need to communicate something that might not really be happening. So can you have a finished rendering in gravity? Absolutely not. But the, what I present, the, what I put out to the public or put out you know, publicly facing or towards a client is always touched up, is always polished. Very, I don't want to show anything raw. Cool. How do you map the boardroom? Did you just use the Guardian feature in Oculus? I can do it now. I mean, there's this funny transition where, and this happened in 1994 when I put the headset on. You immediately become aware of like, in my case, like how chubby Corona has made me. The minute I put a headset on, I know I'm like the clown doing the clown dance, but the let's face it, Facebook, they created a really good piece of technology. I put that headset on and I'm talking and I know I have their attention now. So it's a performance. And I map everything out. It's always fun to move towards some furniture because I can see it through the cameras. I create that cage very quickly, open the thing. It's a minute and a half maximum. And then take the headset off, hold it up, and they're in the space. And they've already forgotten whatever awkward moment they've experienced because they're always blown away. That's awesome. Um Nice to meet you. I'm also an eyewear designer. I will connect with you on LinkedIn and behind. How's it going, Alan? I look forward to it. Good stuff. Ooh. I'd be curious to see what kind of eyewear. I know that, it, and here's something, and, and Daniela, you've said a few words to this a few times. You've maybe sort of like hinted at it. I've been doing this for so long that designers, we naturally just collect influence and idea. That's what we, that's our life's blood. And so when somebody says, oh, I am a footwear designer, I think, no, you're not. Come on. You're a designer who happens to be designing footwear right now. And I, I would encourage people, don't limit yourself. Because I started studying and people said, oh, yeah, you can't do that. You can't be a car. That, don't, don't do car design. Don't do eyewear. And literally, if I look at my career, every project, every job I've had it's like a series of things that people told me oh yeah you can't design that so I look forward to talking to you Alan it'll be very interesting how do you get them oriented to the tools without a huge tutorial yeah, also designed I work for the past 22 years dude Alan no tools never ever give anybody that's not a designer the controllers they will ruin your model so mm -hmm. I what I do is I'll map I'll map the space, set everything up. I hold the controllers usually behind their back so they can't see them or somewhere out of sight. And I'll, I'll give them the, the headset because they'll, immediate, they'll immediately start grabbing things and point triggers and then it's a mess. No controllers. Mm -hmm. Sketching by accident and so on. <sighs> yeah, it's a circle of trust. It's a very small circle. Okay, so you are their hands. They, they don't actually need to do anything, right? They just need to yeah, see. The last, the eyewear, since it's Alan, I think, that's asking, but the eyewear, I, I 
I set it up so that, because I knew that I'd already seen the conference room before in a video call or something. And I knew it was just a long, narrow space. And so I just set it up in a row, 25 pairs of glasses. The cool thing was it was a conference room with eyewear. It was kind of a showroom anyway, typical. And I just sort of set them up right over the conference table and you could just walk up and down the row. And it was, it's quite intuitive. You don't need controls for that. We hand off your GS models to engineers. How far have you taken the DFM by yourself into Rhino? Uh, so that's a great question. Back when I started with design, it was just understood that there are, I mean, I had a friend who was a, he was a 3D expert and he made six figures and he worked with designers. It's like now the pressure, and I always, I get worried when I hear people talking about how fast these tools are. The fact is it's still design. It's still storytelling. It's still, how, how do I make my brand of socks more compelling than this brand of socks? That's what designers do. We tell stories, we connect with people. There's a human piece of this. So yeah, how far, I work with engineers all the time and it was funny to listen to the VW CAD expert, to listen to him talk. I think they have their struggles because you have, he's still talking about designers versus, versus engineers. I have similar situations. It's a person by person basis. I have CAD modelers that love it. They're super excited. Like we sort out our file sharing very quickly. It's like, okay, OBJ is the way to go. Or honestly, just give me these or give me those. I mean, mesh is kind of a mess when you're going back and forth with things like SolidWorks. I recommend the most important piece of working with somebody else who's an expert is respect, get to know them as a person, find out what kind of coffee they like. And if you're handing them some crazy ass gravity sketch model that has a beautiful story and a beautiful design, and by the way, management loves it, make sure you deliver it with a nice beverage, an open ear. And if they come back to you and they're worried about file format or they're worried about how to work with your mesh or whatever you have to support the process with some you know with some humanity this is not a this is not a way to like eliminate people out of the out of the workflow this is a way to improve products and improve businesses and brands and so i don't have an easy answer that's a very challenging transition i'm working with very talented 3d model makers right now engineers not just model makers there a lot of them are engineers and it's a personality thing. It's like, you, you just have to learn to, there's no magic bullet. You have to learn to work with, with these people. I love, I love that. It's not, it's not about taking people out of the process. It's bringing more people into the process actually. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Do you have any more questions, audience? Is anyone looking to raise their hand and actually say something out loud? Can you describe the workflow going from Gravity Sketch to a watertight Rhino model? For example, making the Rhino file into a watertight model. Yeah. Headset, find somewhere comfortable to sit, preferably with your feet up, put your headset on, build your Gravity Sketch model, and you have a watertight model. Next question. It's, it's, we have sub D in, in, we have sub D in gravity now. So honestly, and this is, this is the thing. It's like, well, I'm confronted with this question now that the tools are, they're so far beyond my skill set. It's like, if somebody like me gets on a $5,000 race motorcycle, you realize right away, it's like, yeah, this is, this vehicle is not going to be the bottleneck here. I am the tools. I assume you're asking watertight because of 3d printing. It's, it's just workflow. It's if I really know I'm going to 3D print this, like I'm doing some handheld stuff and I'm going to print it, test it. Toothbrushes are a pretty standard ID project. Just make sure whatever's going to, you're going to print, you're building in sub D. That's it. It's that simple. And then obviously, I mean, I'm, I'm really, I'm fascinated by watches and I've been ballpoint pen sketching my watches, but I also want a workflow where I can experience that whole process a bit in gravity or a bit in Rhino. Yeah, the tool is not really dictating it. The long, long answer to a short question. It's just a little bit of forethought. 
why do you need it to be watertight? Are we talking about creating 3D for cutting steel tools for injection molding? Yeah, well then you need an engineer. This is not engineering software in that sense. Not yet. But if it's just for 3D printing, you, you, you can 3D print these things, you know, from the go, as long as you're, as long as you're using uh, sub D. Great. Thanks. And so how much has Gravity Sketch become, like how, what part of your process, like how, how, how big of a part of your process has it become? It's a good question. Did you guys talk about Neuralink uh, yesterday? I heard somebody bring it up. And then the conversation veered off. It's the, it's Elon Musk's idea that like, look, we're ready now for the singularity. We just need, you need to plug it in. And we have to get past the social barrier of like the same problem with Google Glass camera on the face is the problem. How do we get around that? Yeah, it's, it hasn't changed my workflow. It's changed my personality. It's changed who I am as a, as a creative because like I said, the tools, they, that gap for me was always 3D. So I can do the renderings. I mean, I went to a car design school. I can draw beautifully, but then I have to somehow go to an engineer and say, can you please build this? And they'll be the first ones to tell you, yeah, you're cheating. Like that, that's these two surfaces here, that's, that doesn't exist in real space. It's completely changed the way I think. I'm thinking now about if you... It, it changes everything. It's a it, it, it's a game changing technology. I tried to touch on that in the in the talk. This idea of breaking it down like a psychological analysis of these. It's like the five phase, uh, phases of grief, and like everybody goes through them. Well, there's the four phases of discovering this tool, and because it really is kind of a it, it, it's a metaphor. I don't know. There's all this language around it. It's amazing. It changed how I work. I'm much more effective at what I do at the things that I get paid to do. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it does. <laughs> and um, well, I really love that you are now in the fourth phase because I think that's the most important part to be in. And this is kind of like what we are always looking like in the phase that we want people to be at, right? It's, it's we, we want, we always say that we want Gravity Sketch to be invisible to be something that you don't even perceive because the tool is not really what matters. Like what matters is you and the thing that you want to create full stop. Yeah, uh, Nick did ask, he said, I see that I have the questions open now and he asked about handing off and he just wanted to know about design for manufacturing. How far have you taken it by yourself? And the answer is, I mean, I've, I've built surfaces in gravity that I then used in Rhino to give not just to our SolidWorks guy, but actually to a, a mold maker who's able to integrate them. So, I mean, not complete models. I mean, I'm not doing, you know, getting the right draft angles and stuff because we have somebody that does that. You know, he's a, he's a talented uh, model maker, but I just get a little worried when I, when I feel people pushing for like a tool that's gonna go from the idea to like the steel tool. Like, yeah, there's a chain of pe very talented people in there. And I'm always, always uh, concerned about this idea that we can eliminate. You can't eliminate people out of that chain. Go to any store that sells cheap stuff and you'll find those products. But if you want something quality, if, you, if you're building a brand for yourself, if you're, if you're trying to uh, further your business or your brand or your brand story, and it is, it is a chain of almost like artisan level skill and talent that you need to have. Nick, <laughs> since that was your question about DFM. Um, Matthew here, Matthew Clark says that he's still an evangelist. It's also great to have evangelists, Matthew. I love that he's writing that, right? He has, yeah. to, he has to tell people. You made it a thing now, like the four faces. That's right. Um, could, couldn't agree more. Jack of all trades, master of none is a saying for a reason. Yeah. 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 Well, business people get excited. All you have to do is actually have that rush. I actually developed a product with a friend of mine 
for fun. Like we were just messing around. And then a year later, it's like, oh my God, this thing, this might make us a lot of money. And then you can, you can see how your brain starts to shift around this idea of, of making tons of money from something and, and actually, you know, and that's great. I get it, but it leads to some pretty flawed thinking or it leads to, I don't know what it leads to, but it's not, it's not where like this love of creative work, it's not the same way of thinking. It's this idea of, of a yeah, jack of all trades. I think that's the fantasy for any employer. Right. They would love to, they would love to just find somebody that can do everything, but that's traditionally that ends up being that, that really just exhausted employee that doesn't, they're not going to last anyway, you know? So. Brad. Yep. All right. Well, we'll leave it with that. Noah, thank you so much for, for joining around and for giving us this really, really beautiful presentation. Absolutely. I had a lot of fun, Danielle, anytime. And like I said, anybody that wants to connect, I know I'm not like full on Instagram or whatever, but Behance, YouTube, or honestly, just like any, you could find me on LinkedIn as well. It's quite easy. I'd love to talk to anybody about this stuff because evangelism, that doesn't just go away. It's still there. So. Definitely. Cool. All right. Well, um, stay tuned, everyone. Uh, we will be back in 15 minutes with Michael Smith from Ford presenting his human machine learning uh, presentation. See you in a bit. Bye. Bye, guys.